Then when the state police went and talked to the folks in the room, they didn't take the money from them. They, they were scared to death. They didn't want to talk. Have a seat. Call the uh, December 15th, 2010 meeting to have the planning designation uh, to order. First one, the matter of business is public comments. I have three. And James. That was James. Topic of land conservation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the commission. My name is Ellis W. James. I'm a lifelong resident of Hampton Roads and proudly of Norfolk. There is something that occurred yesterday in terms of the release of this new study as it pertains to the Bay. I think it's extremely important and I wanted to be sure that each of you had had an opportunity to pay attention to it or to at least take a look at it. The question of land conservation is one of the least talked about issues as it comes to our concern about how, what we're going to do to restore the bay. However, it is now front and center thanks to uh, Scott Harper and the Virginian pilot because he did address this and I would like to invite your attention to it when you have time. It's on page three in the Virginian pilot December the 14th. Land conservation is one of the critical issues which is a part of the effort to restore the bay and I think that most everyone around this table has an interest in that and would like to see us move forward on that and I would invite your attention to it and the staff's attention to it Mr. Farmer because I think this is a critical part of it. Thank you very much Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Next speaker is Cale uh, Jaffe from the Southern Environmental Law Center. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you all uh, very much. My name again is Cale uh, Jaffe with Southern Environmental Law Center. I want to briefly address uh, the ODEC coal plant proposed for Surrey County and uh, a point that was raised by ODEC um, at the last meeting here. <coughs> Uh, as you've already heard by now, this is a uh, power plant would be 1,500 megawatts, the single largest coal-fired power plant in Virginia. At the last meeting, ODEC said they needed this power plant because of a need of 7,200 megawatts of new power by 2020. Uh, that assertion on the 7,200 megawatts, uh, frankly, is, is a little misleading, and it's also wrong. Uh, it's misleading because more than 90% of that claimed 7,200 megawatt figure is not to serve any of ODEC service territory. According to Governor McDonald's uh, Virginia Energy Plan, ODEC accounts for less than 10% of Virginia's energy consumption. Most of that need is, is Dominion and other investor-owned utilities. So to the extent that ODEC is relying on that 7,200 number, uh, what they're telling you is that they're, they're, they're not building this power plant to serve their own customers, they're building it uh, to sell to Dominion or other utilities. Uh, but even more importantly, uh, the 7,200 megawatt figure, frankly, is grossly exaggerated. Uh, the economic downturn has led to historic drops in electricity demand. The U.S. Department of Energy has reported that electricity use fell both in 2008 and in 2009. That's the first time DOA has recorded back-to-back -back negative growth years in more than 60 years of data collection. Department of Energy predicts that over the next 25 years as the economy rebounds, electricity demand will grow at an average rate of 1% per year. Uh, while Virginia might grow more quickly than the nation as a whole, staff for the State Corporation Commission has testified that even a 2% growth rate would be, quote, unrealistically high for, for our state. Uh, that all said, the forecast to support <coughs> the 7,200 megawatt statistic is based on a growth rate of 2.26%, more than double what DOE predicts. 
Now, ODEC has said that they'd like to bring this plant online by 2020 or 2022. This gives Hampton Roads a great opportunity. Over the next 10 years, Hampton Roads can invest in efficiency programs which have a much stronger jobs per kilowatt hour ratio than a coal-fired power plant. Insulating office buildings, upgrading heating and cooling systems in schools, installing new appliances in homes, all of that puts people to work now. And it helps meet future energy needs without polluting Hampton Roads and the Chesapeake Bay. So as the PDC considers whether to weigh in with the Army Corps of Engineers, which is actively processing an application for ODEC, I would respectfully encourage you to consider these facts in your deliberations. Thank you all very much. Thank you, sir. Next speaker is Bob Burnley, Wise Energy from Virginia. Welcome, Mr. Burnley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the Commission. Uh, my name is Bob Burnley. I'm uh, an environmental advisor from Richmond here today on behalf of uh, Wise Energy for Virginia. I was here in October um, to speak to you about the human health and environmental dangers and the costs of, uh, of this um, Cypress Creek power plant to Hampton Roads PDC localities. And I want to continue that discussion for a moment this morning with emphasis on costs. Later in this morning's meeting, you'll receive a report on the watershed implementation plan revisions that have been made since your, um, your last meeting. And on the surface, um, some of these changes may appear positive for local governments. But if we look a little deeper, I don't believe that they are that attractive. Um, what they're doing is moving the, the costs for compliance um, from, from one segment of the population to another segment of the population. In, in many of your localities, agriculture um, is a large component of the economy. If the revised watershed improvement plan depends more heavily on reductions of nutrients from agricultural lands than from urban stormwater, um, as I said, the burden is just being shifted from one segment of the population to another. Now, if we consider this power plant, and we know that ozone is an impediment to the development of many crops, if the ODEC plant is built, then crop yields potentially decrease, and the cost for controlling nutrients from stormwater discharges because of these changes in the WIP, the, these costs on farms increase uh, because this power plant is depositing tons of nitrogen every year on land all across the PDC then if, if crop development decreases and costs increases, um, then income is reduced and costs rise. What happens to the agricultural component of the economy when that happens? Uh, what happens to the people who make their living farming and supporting farmers? Um, I think that the outcome is obvious. Um, much more burden on agriculture, fewer people um, involved in it because of, of the lack of return on their efforts. Just one more point on these um, watershed improvement plan revisions. <clears throat> the new WIP also depends more heavily on nitrogen removal from wastewater treatment plants. Uh, again, shifting that burden from urban stormwater <coughs> to point source discharges from the conventional wastewater treatment systems. <clears throat> Those reductions are going to be outrageously <coughs> expensive. Uh, because the old limits were at or near the limits of technology. And again, your citizens are going to pay for those costs as well. So if these thousands of tons of nitrogen coming from this plant every year enter the bay, you may very well see no improvements in water quality for all the hundreds of millions of dollars that you're going to spend to comply with the TMDL. As I said to you in October, I just hope you'll, you'll think individually and collectively um, about the downsides of this plan, and I think that you will find that, uh, again, that the burdens far outweigh any of the benefits. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Sir. That concludes the uh, individual signed up for public comment. Our next matter is the approval of the agenda. I know we have one.
addition, uh, business, the sort of preservation commission training, which I think you have at your seats, which uh, was something that grabbed my thought to, I think, our, our last meeting. That's an addition to the agenda. Did commission members have any other additions or amendments to the agenda? <coughs> so, I have a motion to approve the uh, agenda with the, the one, one addition to old business. Uh, so moved. Is there a second? Yeah. Yeah. second all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, take a sign. Okay. <coughs> commission members had a chance to look at the consent agenda. Uh, are there any Removals or comments on the consent agenda. If not, we hear a motion to the consent agenda. Move the consent agenda. Sure. Second. The probably moves and seconded. Uh, all in favor of the, uh, approving the consent agenda say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. It's unanimous. Let's go to our regular agenda, and that is item uh, number 14. Uh, <coughs> Yes, like you want to take the, uh, the, the bylaws. Uh, what, initi this, what initiated this particular item was uh, from the TPO side, there's a, there's been a long standing conflict between the meeting date of the TPO meeting uh, and the meeting date of the Commonwealth Transportation Board. There's also been a, a, a time compression issue for the TPO uh, meeting, and that we typically run out of time at about the noon hour. Uh, Mayor Krasnoff led a group of folks to discuss what to do with the TPO meeting. As most of you know, uh, they officially voted according to their bylaws to change the meeting date from the third Wednesday at 10.30 uh, till noon to the third Thursday from 10.30 till as late as 12.30 to give the TPO up to a two-hour window uh, to conduct their business. There, there were some uh, PDC members who've expressed some concern about meeting on two separate days covering both board meetings. I uh, chose to put this on the agenda for your consideration today. I think in having a conversation with Ms. Gartner, I think she's probably revealed to me there's been a little bit of confusion about remarks that I and others may have made at the previous meeting. So to clarify that, if the, P if the PDC decides to change its meeting dates, uh, there are two ways to do that. One is a temporary way. Each month you will vote during a meeting, such as this meeting, to change the January meeting date and time. The bylaws say to make a permanent change in meeting date and time, there has to be two readings of the of proposed amendment to the bylaws, and it has to occur during the quarterly full commission meeting. So we can take a temporary action today on a month-to-month -month basis to change the January meeting. In January, if you so desire to make a permanent change, you can have a first reading in January, which is the next available full commission meeting, and then have a second reading in April. So until the April meeting, you'd have to take this action each month. So uh, we put in here uh, an agenda item to discuss whether or not you'd like to change your uh, meeting date to another date and time or leave it the way it is. I think we addressed this at the last meeting after Mayor Krasnoff to his uh, um, uh, the, the round robin thing with the various members. I think we just, we, there was consensus that we wanted to keep it on the, on the same date. Am I correct about that? That's right. Uh, I, I would suggest that we hand it, if there's not any further discussion on it, there is, let's do it now, but uh, if there's not, I would suggest we do one motion where we agreed to, uh, to meet on January the 20th of two, uh, 2011 at 9.30 a.m. this location. Can I ask a quick question? Sorry. Is it? Uh, yes. I, I don't recall the issue of why Thursday. Oh, we had, uh, for, uh, for Mayor Krasnoff's uh, committee, uh, we did a, a review of availability of the boardroom uh, on a regular basis compared to when other municipalities held board meetings, council meetings. We had, I believe, three possibilities of dates. Two of them still had conflicts with advisory committees. And essentially, if I remember correctly, the third Thursday was the only clean date that did not conflict with any council or board meetings from the localities and was a clean date uh, for a time slot in this location at, at the morning time frame. Okay, so. So it's Thursday for the TPO and at 10.30 10 with the intent of two hours. Up to two hours. Up to two hours. 
and then the uh, HRPDC, we would go to Thursday, same Thursday, morning, yeah, afternoon, nine what, 9.30? 9.30. Nine thirty. Yeah, nine thirty. Yeah. 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 With, with no interference onto the, the TPO. Well, as long as we are adjourned by 10.30, there would be no interference. As we're doing now. And then they had some discussion. I was the one that raised concern because those of us, especially those of us that live, who live up in the Williamsburg area, we're, we're committing really two full days um, in a row to come down to meetings here. <coughs> you know, if, by the time you come to a 930 meeting in Nolfa or Chesapeake, the, the day is, is almost gone for us. And so to commit two days in a row was going to be pretty difficult for those of us trying to earn earn a uh, living in other fashions besides being a county supervisor. <laughs> and, the, uh, the, the question um, that I have, so if I understand that, having to drive from North York County, um, the, the question I have concerning the, the, the mix is that generally when we come in here, it's been my experience over the years of doing this now, is that uh, we pretty much listen, we get in the receive mode, and if we haven't had the debate before it occurs, before the meeting occurs, there's no time for debate or any any substantive discussion because we, it falls off the table in an hour. You just can't do it because of the load. Is that because, not to deviate off this issue, but is that because our agenda is too packed or is it that we just do this by exception? Uh, I think my observation of the experience is for the Planning District Commission, I wouldn't characterize the PC too packed. Today's fairly large agenda with the presentation, and I believe you can look back historically and see there's been a fair amount of discussion debate on the PDC issue. So I wouldn't put the one hour for the PDC. I'd say one every three or four meetings we might be compressed as compared to the TPO, which almost virtually every meeting we're compressed. So there's a little of that. Um, there is the option of nine o'clock, but I think that's a for an hour to use the phone that's what's in a pretty early hour. But do we have in our bylaws whatever we have to buy exception because we could do this, say okay the meeting is gonna be nine o'clock as opposed to nine thirty to still give the same time to bet whatever we talked we, we talked about that and I think we talked about that on that round robin the telephone conference and that was an option we knew there was a hot topic coming we could set it earlier. We could ask the TPO to be, give us a little extra time, or we could have a set a special meeting, and if we needed to be prepared to do that, if the, if the, the right topic and the right need arose. Yeah, and, and in that case, then the flexibility there would be great. It would make sense to put them both on the same day. So, okay. great, thank you. The that a motion is made. You're asking that motion right. Back to right. you second. Yes, yeah. made and seconded. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Okay, that meeting is set for January the 20th at 9.30 a.m. Uh, and a second a motion that if, if there's not further, if there's further discussion, I, we need to go ahead and I guess make a motion to authorize staff to prepare uh, to amend the bylaws and present that uh, at our first reading at January meeting. That's correct. Is that a safe statement of motion that should be? Uh, that, is, that is a good okay. Do I have to hear that motion? Mr. Krasnow, Mr. Krasnow, Mr. Krasnow, Mr. Second. Second. Right. Okay. And probably moved and seconded. All in favor? Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same signs unanimous. <laughs> next matter is our enhanced road defense fund study. As you know, in the Regional Cooperation Act, the Code of Virginia calls for a planning commission as an angle to collect and maintain demographic, economic, and other data concerning the region of a number of localities and act the state data set affiliated cooperation with the Employment Commission. In keeping with that mandate, staff has completed this uh, sixth annual regional report. We have Greg Rupendorf here, our chief economist, to uh, tell us about this. It's a, it's a fascinating uh, document that uh, I think we all can use in, in uh, not only current planning, but as uh, we look down the road and we have to uh, work and uh, bring it to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, you all should have received this document in your packet, the 2010 uh, Hampton Roads Regional Benchmarking Study. I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Uh, benchmarking study was actually born out of a federal OEA grant that we received in 2005 um, to provide sort of a comprehensive view of the regional economy. 
Often we hear exciting tidbits in the press of what's going on, uh, ratings and rankings that are quite often based off just one or two points, uh, data points. This document kind of attempts to provide the whole story, uh, multiple angles, multiple perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a sixth edition that we have. Uh, each edition evolves new data, new information. Uh, this edition is uh, eight chapters, 87 graphs, 120 pages and several thousand data points. Uh, I'd like to take you through it just a little. A few years back, in response to a request we had from some of the city and county staff, uh, we started including these jurisdictional snapshots. That was just simply to provide uh, some perspective for each locality so people knew how, how their locality um, measured up. Um, so that's why we have a jurisdictional snapshot there for each locality. Uh, at the end of that section, we have um, rankings from the uh, Census Bureau, the American Community Survey rankings. And um, what we did here is we compared Hampton Roads against the 100 most populous metropolitan areas in the U.S. Again, uh, just a point of perspective. Uh, here are some of the areas where we rank rather high. Uh, I didn't include all of them, but you can see that we are second in terms of the percentage of the civilian population who are veterans. Um, no surprise there, but it's positive in that we retain our military. Um, we're fourth for the uh, percentage who worked outside the county of residence. Um, that just denotes that we have a high degree of regional interaction. Um, 31.2 percent of our population is African American. That's the eighth highest. Um, we have a relatively highly transient population. 17.9 percent have moved in the past year. And we are 22nd highest in terms of the um, number of people who have completed high school education. And while that's a very positive number, we are 67th highest in terms of the population of uh, completed bachelors, and I think that's just indicative of the, the regional employment opportunities that we have in our industrial sector mix. Um, some areas where we ranked on the low side, and <coughs> ranking low is not always such a bad thing. Um, mean travel time, we were 59th. That's not such a bad thing to be um, have a low median travel time. Um, we are a relatively young metropolitan area comparatively. Um, we rank 77th in this respect, and I was actually a little frightened to realize that I'm well above median age. 63.2% um, of housing units are owner-occupied. Once again, um, we are some, somewhat of a transient population. Um, that's why we have uh, fewer owner-occupied housing. And we have relatively low poverty rates. So. <coughs> And again, this is just comparing us to the 100 most populous metropolitan areas. I'm um, getting sort of into the meat of the document here. Um, what we have through the document, each, each uh, indicator is represented graphically. Uh, we have a brief indication um, as to why it is important, uh, so you can go through that, and then how we are doing. And um, at the end, accompanied in the appendix, we have uh, a data set for each chart. Um, there are quite a few quite a few charts, graphs in the report. I'd just like to take you through a couple of them, give you sort of a flavor of what the report is like. Uh, let me go back to that. Uh, much to Dwight's chagrin, I actually really like showing this chart. Um, <laughs> Dwight doesn't like measuring us up against Morocco per se, but I think it provides a fair amount of perspective. Um, this basically shows the size of the Hampton Roads regional economy uh, compared to some of the international, uh, you have Vietnam, Morocco, Bangladesh, Angola, Croatia, Cuba. Um, so you can see how the size of our economy ranks with um, other international economies. And um, we are significant. I think there's no doubt about it. Um, <laughs> given, of course, that we have quite a smaller population in those countries. Uh, however, admittedly, um, if you look at how we've changed, uh, this is from our 2002 document. And if I keep uh, all the countries, you might not be able to read the names on there, but um, 
using the same set of countries over time, you can see 2002 were the red bar, 2004, 2005, 2007, and 2008. Um, our relative significance is slipping um, across the region, but we are still significant. Um, we are a force, and I think that's something that uh, is important to remember. Uh, this next, next chart, I've probably showed it up here, I can't count how many times and I never tire of showing it, uh, for the simple reason that it is impressive. Uh, it's an impressive chart. Um, looking back 20 years, not once has our unemployment rate been above that of the U.S. And, uh, and I think that provides uh, you know, something that we need to look at and recognize how important that is. Um, just to provide some perspective, if the Hampton Roads unemployment rate were to increase to that of the national level, that would be equivalent to approximately 18,000 additional people being unemployed, uh, roughly equivalent to the number of people that work at Naval Air Station Oceana. So it's no small feat that we have um, such a low unemployment rate. <clears throat> For 40 years, 40 years, the Bureau of Economic Analysis has been tracking metropolitan area incomes. For 40 years, not once has Hampton Roads been above the national average, until 2009. I mean, I feel like we should have streamers from the ceiling here. This is, this, when I saw this, I was blown away. We finally caught up to, to the national average. Now, admittedly, 1985-1986, uh, we came extremely close. We almost topped it 1985-1986, and then we slid. We slid all the way to 2000. Uh, in 2000, we started getting uh, more military income coming into the area. We had increased defense expenditures, and that really bumped us up to 2003. And then in 2009, um, the nation experienced a much greater hit than we did with respect to the economy and that propelled us over the top. So this is, this at first glance, and when I say this, this document tells the whole story, well here's why. At first glance, that is pretty impressive. And actually at second glance, it's not so bad as well. If you compare us to our uh, competing metropolitan areas, we, you see that we rank quite favorably. Obviously Washington, D.C. is way up and above but looking at, back at some of the other metro areas, um, our per capita income, which really denotes you know, quality of life issue, is, is relatively high. And this is where it hurts. Uh, when we look at the purchasing power of our per capita income, uh, we are hurt in that regard because we do not compare favorably with the other metro areas. That means what we can get for each dollar is much lower than the other areas that we can compete with. So even though our incomes have gone up, uh, what we can do with our incomes has not kept up. And one of the reasons uh, why is the cost of living in, in Hampton Roads. Um, the Council for Community and Economic Research puts together a publication, and while it may not be perfect, it is by far the best measure we have to compare metro areas in terms of cost. And you can see pretty much across the board, housing, miscellaneous goods and services, which compose the, the majority of expenditures, uh, healthcare, transportation, utilities, and even groceries pops up and down um, from quarter to quarter. But above, we are way above board in terms of cost of living at Hampton Roads. Um, and just for a comparison's sake, if we look back to 1999, 2009, um, in 1999 our index was at 97.9, in 2009 rather it was 110.6. Now what this means is there has been a 12% reduction in relative purchasing power. A 12, this, isn't, this isn't that we've had inflation. This is how we compare it to other metro areas. We've had a 12% reduction in purchasing power. So while our incomes have risen since 1999, the reduction in purchasing power, the increase in the cost of goods in the, the area has all but offset that increase in income. Uh, moving on from income is the scary chart. Um, here we have national defense spending. And uh, the reason I, I say this is a scary chart, let's see if I can get this to work, is if you look here, right there is uh, on the chart 1985-1986. If you recall what I said about when our per capita income almost caught up to the national average, that was 1985-1986, right at the peak. Now here we are again. 
catching up to the national average. Um, this is a scary chart because it shows how much defense spending impacts income, impacts our region, and you can see where the peaks are. Um, now looking forward, uh, you can perhaps be optimistic or maybe more of a realist, um, but the future remains uncertain, so we'll stick with this. We don't know what's coming on here, but we do know that there is a significant impact. Whatever, uh, whatever the future holds with defense spending will certainly impact our region. Uh, we talk quite a bit about industry in the document, um, the, the strengths and the industries we have. I uh, just put one, this chart in specifically because um, there's quite often more than one story with each graphic that you're looking at. Here you can see the concentration of shipbuilding, repair and employment in Hampton Roads. Um, and this, this graphic certainly looks positive. We've got an increase in concentration. Unfortunately, we have an increase in concentration and a decreasing market. Um, but you take that one step further, um, as our market share increases and there's fewer opportunities elsewhere in the nation to compete with, we at least have the, the Navy uh, continues to struggle back in there for ships. So uh, as other opportunities to build ships decrease, uh, we, we do have sort of uh, fortified stronghold there. Um, talking a little bit about uh, for, um, the ports, here we have foreign and domestic vessel departures. You'll notice two significant drops. We, you know, we hear about what happens at the port in terms of uh, capacity quite often. Um, and if you look at the peach section on the chart, that's the foreign portion of port traffic versus blue is the American portion. And the American portion is held quite constant since 2001. Uh, the foreign portion, which we have no control over, um, has decreased dramatically. And these two bars that I just put on top denote these are the recessions, so you can see how much the recessions first for us and the global economy, how much of an impact that has on our vessel departures. Uh, we have a section on housing in the report. Uh, I just want to put this, this chart in. Uh, kind of looks like an incredible mountain, um, but it just denotes the sheer significance of what happened in the housing market. Uh, the regional housing market, we saw, we saw a fantastic <coughs> increase. And the significance of that increase is just denoted here, and then you can um, understand a little bit why housing prices have come down and why the building market has come down so much to, to make up for that uh, sizable increase. Uh, demographic section in the report, uh, I put this slide up there. This is population growth. Uh, only one time in the past 15 years has Hampton Roads population growth exceeded the nation. Now, population growth does not necessarily equate to quality of life. I want to make that clear, but it is something we need to consider when we're looking at other statistics. Once in the last 15 years, and we can we can kind of look at what's going on. Um, the population basically const constitutes births, deaths, and net migration. And uh, births and deaths have been relatively uh, flat over the past few years, but we've seen significant um, migration changes and substantial out-migration. Um, we recognize this. We put in a request to the IRS to try to get some of that information so we can find out um, who is moving and hopefully where they're moving to. Uh, last chart I wanted to show you here was um, graduation rates in Hampton Roads. Uh, sometimes the, the information we have um, takes a little bit to explain. Uh, Hampton Roads is at the blue bars there compared with the state average in terms of graduation rates and you can see how we were pretty far off from the state average going all the way through 2008. Uh, part of this was just simply a methodology issue of how they calculated the rates. They adjusted the methodology to more accurately account for who was graduating and tracking students through the system in 2008, uh, which vastly improved the regional ranking, but we still lag behind the state in terms of graduation rates. Uh, finally, data. Um, and I put an exclamation point at the end of data because as an economist, this is exciting. Um, we put the data in there and we put the source of the data in there so that others, uh, your staff, people who are interested in the document can see what we've done and perhaps take the information and use it and make their own analysis. And, uh, and this, as an economist, that's rarely the case. So um, we put the data in there and hopefully uh, people can take that, make their own analysis and come back to us. Um, 
I, I frequently hear how this, this document is taken as a great regional reference, and I would encourage everybody to flip through it, uh, pass it on to your staff, pass it on to others. Um, we'd love to get comments and suggestions of what we can do better, different. Uh, what else you'd like to see in there? Any reclamations? Please let us know. Um, of course, when this document is approved by the Commission, we'll have it available on the Commission's website, so you can look at it there. Um, and if you want additional copies for you or staff, uh, please see me or Kelly, and we can make sure that we can get you another one. Uh, but that uh, concludes my formal remarks, so I'll be happy to answer questions you might have. Thank you, Greg. Mayor Sessions. I don't think I understand what purchasing power of per capita income is because I sit back and saw the income increasing, but then when I look at, I would think the cost of living and health care in Washington, for instance, would be higher than here. Yes. Um, if I can go back to that chart. <coughs> You are correct. Um, a lot of those costs are going to be much higher in Washington. What this does, though, is it equates the amount of income with how much it costs to purchase something. So, for instance, if it costs 10% more for health care in Washington, their <coughs> incomes are 12% higher, then they're doing better. Uh, all right. Okay. Uh, all right. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm. There are other comments or questions by Eric Kessler. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. I apologize. The voice. You have another document that talks about the MSS, <coughs> metropolitan statistical areas, and how we relatively compare it, whether it be Baltimore, San Antonio, Charlotte, or Jacksonville. And I think we were like in the 30s uh, a year or so ago. I don't really know if that's correct or not. But is there another document that actually talks about the MSA? Uh, what compo uh, we have the, the data book which has some information on the, the metropolitan areas as well. This is the only document that we have that shows a graphical representation though. Because our competition, I appreciate the references to Vietnam and all, but San Antonio, Texas is your <coughs> competition uh, when it comes to where the companies are going to be settling or not. I'd like to know, uh, or at least maybe the board would like to know, Mr. Chairman, how we relatively compare because in terms of job creation, uh, that's where we're going to be competing against the San Antonio's, the Charlotte's, uh, and if there's a document that relatively can help us to do a better job, we have to be it. Okay, there is at the, at the end of the introduction, there's a page that compares us to the 100 most populous metropolitan areas, so you can see how we rank. Um, in terms of looking at specifically San Antonio, um, and other uh, other metro areas that are seeing um, strong growth, uh, that is certainly something we can we can add. That would be my thought, Mr. Chairman. Do you you want to make a motion to have staff come? I don't know if there needs a motion or just a consensus or your direction. I mean, I think it would be helpful for municipalities uh, to see how we can improve that in terms of economic development. Absolutely, we'll come back. Very good. Any other questions for Greg? I, I noticed sure. that the uh, coast. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, if I might, Greg, going back to uh, slide 11 and 12, I'm interested in this purchasing power uh, indication of where we are at the same time. If you look back over time, uh, like for example, if you were to take this chart and look back 10 years, um, we would still be in that same position right on the end. The only thing that is really, well, two things have changed since then. Our incomes have increased dramatically relative to um, other regions, but so have our costs. So both incomes and costs in the Hampton Roads region mar marched up uh, almost at, at, at a pretty comparable pace. Um, so that would be the only, um, the only thing I could add to that. 
we have seen costs going up, especially with housing. When, when housing prices went up, starting in 2003, we saw a significant jump in housing. And along with housing, we saw costs rise elsewhere. But during that time, we had seen such substantial increases in regional income that, that like I said, the two kind of marched up together. So we remain in the same place um, on this chart here, but our circumstances are different in that our incomes are higher and our costs are higher. Question. I noticed that Pecosin was the, the highest per capita income, and I just wanted to know what kind of Christmas dinner was. On the, you know, I'm sitting here looking at these numbers and you know, looking at this chart, and, and essentially the way you've described it is income versus expenditure, so your capability of purchasing things. And there's two parts of this that I'm really interested in, is the tail end, or considering Orlando is a big uh, tourist area, um, and on the peninsula we've been trying to push tourism. Uh, Charleston, which is not a tourist area that I can tell, is more of a industry naval type of operation, which is very similar to Jacksonville in some regards. But Jacksonville is a, a city that has um, experienced ex unbelievable growth in the last 30 years. And what kind, how do you take into account in these, this kind of chart this, the, the growth of a community and its effect on what we're describing here? Well, the growth of the community will be reflected in, in multiple ways. One of the ways that growth will be reflected is growth typically pushes up prices. Um, increased demand, increased supply, your price will go up, so, and that will go across the board. Um, high growth areas typically see a, a, an adjustment in, in prices, um, but along with high growth quite often comes the income. Uh, income jumps substantially when you have growth areas, and so what, what this chart is not going to show you necessarily where the growing communities are, um, because their balance, this is balance in income versus price. Um, some of the areas that have been, ha have had strong growth um, here have had, like for, for example, Hampton Roads, we've had strong income growth. Um, but the fact that our prices have, have kept pace with income keeps us on that lower end. Other areas that have been able to keep prices down, perhaps they didn't have quite the housing boom that we saw, um, that would hold prices back. Then you could see them sliding up the scale um, so that their incomes will go further uh, and have greater purchasing power. But this chart would really not reflect growth. It would be how growth has been managed or how growth has been manifested with respect to income and purchasing. Okay, yeah, because I see other things tied in there too. It doesn't reflect the tax rates, you know, but because that affects purchasing power, things like that. So, I, there's a lot of there's a lot of hidden parts in here that that would be interesting to see. But I'm not going to go any further with it. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments? Thank you. Uh, next matter is the. Uh, I'll, I'll move to approve for distribution. Okay. A motion to, to approve the distribution the uh, packet. Sir. Probably move second. All favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Unanimous. Next matter is uh, uh, the total maximum daily load um, and the recommended local government action for that. Uh, uh, Jennifer, you can go ahead and talk to us about that. Okay. Good morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, I'm here today to give you another update on the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. And I have good news. Uh, your comments on Virginia's watershed implementation plan were well received. Virginia submitted an improved impl implementation plan to EPA last month on time. They have addressed EPA's major concerns with the plan. The new plan only requires stormwater treatment for 23% of impervious lands compared to the 65% required by the EPA backstops. The plan requires HRSD to reduce an additional 2 million pounds of nitrogen from their treatment plants to discharge the James River. And Virginia also included stronger reasonable assurances for the reductions required from agriculture. This included a pledge to pursue regulations if tracking indicates two-year milestones are not being met. The most significant change the state made to the plan was to hold the James River load reductions to a level consistent with tributary strategies pending an examination of the chlorophyll A criteria. 
If the floor filet criteria does not change, then waste storage treatment plant permits will be adjusted in 2017 to meet the remaining 3 million pound reduction needed by 2025. If EPA deems that this plan is sufficient to avoid implementation of their proposed backstops, then stormwater costs in Hampton Roads will decrease by 75%. It is expected that EPA will announce whether or not they will approve Virginia's plan prior to the publication of the final team deal on December 31st. If Virginia's plan is accepted, then localities will be able to focus on planning efforts to determine how they can achieve their allocations on existing development. Localities can also provide support for state and federal legislation that may provide funding for implementation actions. This table is a comparison of percent load reductions from existing levels. The final Virginia WIP is more equitable than the proposed EPA plan. Under Virginia's revised plan, agriculture will make significant reductions and the stormwater reductions are considerably less onerous than the EPA backstops. Due to the difference in cost of nutrient controls for each sector, Virginia's plan is more cost effective than EPA's backstops. The savings for Hampton Roads localities is $7.2 billion. The additional reductions required by point sources could cost as much as $1 billion, but the Virginia plan still results in significant cost savings to Hampton Roads ratepayers. Um, this table details the estimated annual household cost of EPA's plan versus Virginia's plan. Additional savings to Hampton Roads residents would result from implementation of urban fertilizer controls. This would include nutrient management plans for local government owned properties and restriction on household fertilizer application. Virginia indicated in the plan that they will first encourage voluntary management before pursuing legislation in 2017. In order to put these fees in perspective, I have highlighted uh, localities with existing stormwater fees. Those fees range from $50 to $100 per year. Um, if the total cost of achieving the stormwater requirements was passed on to residents, it would on average triple the fees currently paid by households. However, these rates are based on the generic load reductions of the Phase 1 implementation plan. The load reduction requirements will be defined during the Phase 2 process over the next year and may decrease as requirements for federal and state lands are included. So what methods are available to localities to deal with these reductions? In the next few slides, I'll present some options for program action, policy action, and legal action. Starting in fiscal year 2011, we could explore options for nutrient trading within the region. The additional requirements for wastewater nutrient reductions in Virginia's plan minimize the potential to trade with HRSD but there are some opportunities to trade with agriculture, especially on the western edge of the peninsula. There may also be potential to trade with new development, depending on what standard Virginia selects as part of their stormwater regulation rulemaking. Any trading program will have to balance protection of local water quality. Conducting local watershed assessments will also serve to develop an inventory of potential nutrient reduction projects. Identifying projects in the short term will help localities negotiate stormwater permits and meet the 5% stormwater load reduction requirement by 2015. <clears throat> it will also enable localities to take advantage of grant funds as they become available. It's estimated that these watershed assessments could cost around $100,000 per sub-watershed and there are 15 sub-watersheds within Hanson Roads. Where will funds for programming implementation come from? As illustrated previously, they could come from increasing stormwater fees or implementing new fees. However, a recent Virginia pilot poll indicated that half of 800 respondents did not want to pay anything to clean the bay. The remaining half were split nearly equally between their willingness to pay less than or greater than $150 per household per year. Uh, there are numerous federal grants available for watershed planning and innovative stormwater controls. A PDC staff will work with lo locality staff to begin to bring some of this funding to Hampton Roads. Proposed federal legislation could authorize additional funding for state and local governments. Uh, the Carton Bill, if passed, and appropriations uh, would uh, allocate $1.5 billion for Chesapeake Bay states, and the Holden Bill would allocate $2.4 billion. Um, Virginia also offers small grants to their Water Quality Improvement Fund, and last year the General Assembly did make stormwater utilities eligible for revolving loan funds. The nutrient reductions outlined in Virginia's plan will only be met 
if adequate funding is made available to all sectors. Uh, local governments can improve the likelihood of meeting their stormwater reductions by effectively communicating needs with the Hampton Roads General Assembly and congressional representatives. Last month, we distributed a statement of principles that outline the region's position regarding potential legislation and requested consistent and adequate funding for agriculture, wastewater, and stormwater controls. Uh, staff will monitor proposed legislation over the next few months and recommend meeting with General Assembly and congressional representatives to discuss locality needs and concerns. <coughs> if EPA does not accept Virginia's plan and instead imposes its backstops, then, may, then localities may consider pursuing legal action. Uh, PDC staff has directed special legal counsel to prepare an assessment of the merits of an appeal to CMDL. Staff will schedule a meeting with city attorneys to discuss the assessment in January. Um, so the action I ask you to take today is to authorize staff to meet with congressional and general assembly representatives or staff uh, to discuss concerns and possible solutions regarding the Chesapeake Bay TMDL. Volunteer board members are encouraged to attend these meetings. Thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you uh, yes, sir. Um, first, I want to say thanks for the report. And I just uh, sort of a cautionary note. Savings is, is used in this document and it was used in your presentation, but as, as I see it, this simply reduces the size of the unfunded mandate in Hampton Roads from 9.7 billion to 2.5 billion dollars. And that's 2.5 billion dollars that we have to find out collectively how we're gonna get. So I just, I, I'd hate to see that translate into a newspaper uh, article headline which says, Changes with the Virginia plan will result in savings of 75 percent because we're talking about an increase of 2.5 billion. And um, it, as the mayor said to me, uh, a, a decrease in the projected expenses requirements for Percocin from 90 billion to or 90 million, excuse me, to 27 million is 63 million dollars. We don't have to come up with, but it is still an amount which is larger than our annual budget. So I just a cautionary tale that um, a 25 percent reduction of an unachievable number is still a really really big number. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. Again, uh, every time you get up and breathe, my stomach tightens up. <laughs> uh, and to kind of follow on what uh, Ms. Wheeler was talking about. Uh, <clears throat> I, uh, I looked at the numbers, if I can, this is the first time I've seen this, so I'm kind of, yeah, I've started feeling this elation, oh wow, we're going to have to pay $42 million a year in your county. But when I look at it, to put it in perspective, there's 800, if I read this correctly, just on the stormwater piece alone, it's 800 and some dollars per household per year, which would be greater than the tax increase on in the county on the citizens over the last eight years, so cumulative. Uh, and so this still applies on a 14-year basis, correct? So yes. this would be 800 in addition to four, over a 14-year <coughs> period, which is not only, um, uh, I won't say it's unachievable, but it takes, and for your county, it would add, what was it, about 12 cents to the tax rate. And, you know, that, and what's missing here, and I still don't feel the confidence in it, that, we were pre that what you're presenting is more of a, uh, uh, glad news if the state gets its way and the impression I've got is that the EPA may ha have, have has dug in so much uh, on the high side that we are we're going to end up with good news because we're not getting beat as much uh, doesn't the pain is not as much but this is to me uh, still an issue of funding in a reasonable manner we want to clean up the bay but our, I think our point should be that it doesn't occur of 14 years. I, uh, 14 years is with uh, an increase like this is is um, um, it, it, in a recession or in a down market, and I don't know when we're going to come out of this. Is just I mean, it's just really beating the citizens over the head. Um, this should have taken more time, and I don't know what our. I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know what our state position is anymore. Uh, because it kind of fluctuates, but it should have done over a longer period of time, and it needs to. We need to stress the fact that the pollution here did not occur 
just because of the people that live around the bay. It supported the industry of this whole nation and the state, and we need to have them into the mix in a big way. So, I, this is, I agree. I agree uh, with Cosin uh, that uh, even though this is uh, good news, sort of, uh, it's still a, a brutal uh, uh, result. The, uh, the action items are well taken. I think. Sorry. I was, I was just going to say, Mr. Chairman, if we, I mean, it stands out to me because of the way it was reported in the document, but if you actually sent this bill out to the taxpayers as a cost per household, and they see individually, then we may be a little more community involvement and everybody will know um, where I know this is not an action for the board, but just to, you know, to, for other members of the house. That the, 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 their citizenry needs to know where this is coming from instead of being getting into their annual property tax bill. Mm -hmm. So I hear motion to authorize staff to schedule a meeting with uh, two bodies, the Intro General Assembly and the Governor of the Missouri Commission. Uh, 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 solutions and our Intro Congressional Delegation uh, with the same matter uh, uh, on a federal basis. So moved. Second. Probably do a second in discussion. Just a question, because um, it states here that you know these meetings will be open to board members. Well, when those meetings are scheduled, will we all be notified since it is going to be an open meeting, every time and the place and an appropriate time to plan to attend, so you can plan to attend. We, we can do that, and I asked Jenny to, to modify the slide to strongly request volunteers to tell us that they would like to participate in those discussions because I think having you all there makes for a more effective dialogue. Thank you. Other comments? Other discussions? Yeah, and just to clarify, you know, you talked about our concerns. You know, I mean, you're getting <coughs> right here some concerns, okay? And I'm hoping that would be part of what's being conveyed. I'm not, I mean, it's not been written down other than maybe in the minutes, but I'm sure there's others here that have a lot of concerns that need to uh, need to be asserted to some document or form that you're going to be able to take forward. And we should be able some way of being able to provide that, you know, by some scheduled time. I mean, if so if we approve, yeah, go ahead and do it. Are you going to tell us when you're going to not only do it, but when can we give you inputs, what format you want it in, that sort of thing. Well, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to make the contact, find out when we can meet, if they're willing to meet, uh, we will submit to you the whole board, um, what I would call a battle plan. If time, if it, depending on you know what, when they're available and who's available, I'd recommend we come back if you'd like with a resolution at the January meeting and take a strong position officially on the record. Uh, and then we can carry that with us at uh, any subsequent meeting. And what would be important to this is for the for the group to understand exactly those milestones. Now, my, my understanding here is that phase one ends at, at the end of this month. Phase two, right, goes at the end of next year. And now what happens, and so when our inputs go in, what is happening along the way so that we know how well we're doing in terms of the battle plan? Well, can I ask a question, please? Is your battle plan going to have an option of a way for us to address this that we could be supportive of? The reason I ask this question, and I agree with the comments that have been made, you know, yes, we got, kind of got good news, but we still have a big chunk of money out there that has to come up with. I would suggest that the meetings that are, that are being asked to occur should occur. I don't know that we're going to get any funding from there if we're realistic. And yet this issue still has to be dealt with. Would we not be better having a plan on a way that we can address this? Sooner or later, it, we can either, you know, we're going to get bombed with a big, you know, bill, or we can try to work through this thing and, and deal with it. I mean, sooner or later it's going to come back and bite us. Am I not? Correct me if I'm wrong. You're I mean, correct. You're correct. And I, it, this is a statewide issue also, Mayor Sessom. It's not, Andrew approach does not have to do this alone. You know, the state. That's why we have in here both state delegations as well as federal. Well, but we we need some serious help from the state. Uh, thank you. Other comments? The motion on the floor. All in favor, say aye. 
Commit to being a board member volunteer. That way, we can we can keep you apprised minute by minute, day by day, as to what's going on, so that you will know what the schedule is. You can attend. Got three already. All right, very good. All right. Next item is item number 17. Uh, is uh, something Dwight has said about it, which is uh, kind of shows us an advanced uh, preview of what the, the next few months will be. I kind of like that. I was just idea with that. Well, I had a discussion, a uh, suggestion of Mayor Sessler. Having an advanced uh, uh, look see at the upcoming schedule so you all know. Send the normal agenda item out. If you see something that's a flag, let me know. We can change the upcoming agenda, but then you'll know in, again in month two and three uh, what we're going to put on the plate for action items and, and new things. We'll comment on that. That's a good idea. Uh, the next uh, item number 18 is that the uh, project staff reports information only at, at, as of the correspondence. If there's no comment, we'll comment on those two items. Uh, we'll go to the old, the old business item. <coughs> That is uh, the forest preservation just, just some brief comments, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mayor Krasnov uh, put on the table an observation about uh, uh, historic preservation training. Uh, we've done some preliminary uh, research. There are several options if you all would like to pursue that. So uh, what I would suggest is if uh, you or your staff uh, send us a note that you are interested in this, then we'll pursue. Uh, obviously, if, if there is no interest, then I don't want to commit uh, staff resources, but I think it probably is. So let us know, and then uh, we'll pursue the additional research into what opportunities exist to get some training here. Any other older new business? I would simply say that uh, you all work hard during the year. Uh, it's been a tough year. Uh, go home, family and friends, uh, recharge your batteries, and let's come back in 2011 and make a breakout year for reason economically and all other respects. Thank you. 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 Th